Well, good morning. Please um, open your Bibles to Isaiah. Not Isaiah, Isaiah. <laughs> Chapter 40. I see the memes. And <laughs> I'm going to read from uh, verse 12. Hey, the, the God who owes us nothing, the God who is and is to come, is going to speak to us this morning. He wants to minister to us this morning. We've got an amazing passage. Let's look at it together. Verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God or what likeness compare with him? An idol, a craftsman casts it and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? That I should be like him, says the Holy One, Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. So why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary. And young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is God's word. Uh, We've been thinking yesterday about the, the bigness of God. We saw something of God's heart, his care for people. Uh, today we think more about his, his strength and his power. Uh, God's people, if you look again at verse 27, God's people uh, were in exile at the time Isaiah is addressing here and they feel invisible to God. So they say in verse 27, my way's hidden from the Lord. God can't see me. He has no idea what I'm going through. My right is disregarded by my God. God is just overseen. He's overlooked what I'm going through. And we need to to kind of reckon with this because it's all very well knowing that God cares for us. But the real question then is, if God does care for us, is he in a position to help us? 
There are lots of people who care for you who don't have power and strength and control to really help you. Is that the case with God? And so Isaiah's word to the people feeling this way is to say, you have forgotten who God is. And we need to hear this as well because there are times when we think, does God even know what I'm going through? Has he got any idea what it feels like to be me right now? Some of you are experiencing health issues. Physical health, mental health. Uh, Some of you are experiencing very painful relational issues. Some of you are worrying about about work and finances and, and what happens next. Many of you are going to marry and some of you are going to be unable to. Many of you are going to have kids and some of you are going to be unable to. All of us are going to be going through something at some point and the question is going to come into our minds, does God know? Does he get what I'm, I'm experiencing? Is he ignoring me? Can he see me? Does he realize what's going on? And so this passage is for us. Verses 1 to 11 answer that that worry that God might not care. We saw yesterday that God is our shepherd. And today's passage answers that that worry. Does, Does God not see? Because we see today that he's the creator. He sees everything. And in one sense, the message of this passage is nothing new. That's actually part of the point. Uh, Twice Isaiah says to them, do you not know? Do you not hear? Have you not been listening all this time? Uh, We easily forget what God is like. And so Isaiah's not necessarily trying to tell us something new. He's trying to remind us of something we just don't seem to properly understand and apprehend. It goes without saying, yeah, 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 we know God made the world. But do we really think through the implications of what that means? So Isaiah doesn't just say to us, yes, God is your sovereign, God is your creator. Isaiah rubs our faces in it. He shows us what that actually means. And so we're going to see uh, two sort of big ideas in the text this morning, that, that God is our sovereign. We see that in verses 12 to 26. We see his sovereignty over creation, his sovereignty over the nations, his sovereignty over people. And then in verses 27 to 31, we see that God is our strength. And more than that, only God is these things. Only God is our sovereign and only God is our strength. There is no one else like him. So again, he keeps saying, to to whom will you liken God? Verse 18. Uh, Verse 25, to whom then will you compare me? If you're beginning to line anyone or anything up alongside God and and try and figure out which is going to be the most used to you, you've forgotten what God is like. So firstly, God alone is our sovereign. Verses 12 to 26. We see God's sovereignty firstly over creation. And so Isaiah fires out these questions in verses 12 to 14. And the, the answer is so obvious, it doesn't need to be provided. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Okay, Isaiah is saying, you know, hands up if that was you. Have you done that? So just just look at your hand for a moment. Uh, What can you fit in your hand? A ball? That's impressive. Um, how How much water can you hold in your hand? A spoonful? If you're Dr. Kimball, two spoonfuls. (laughs) So here's the thing, with God, all the waters of the earth can fit in his hands. Who measured the water in the hollows of his hands? All of the Pacific, all of the Atlantic, all of it, easy. God can can measure that in his hands. That's... That's easy for him. 
So next time you're at the beach, or if you're not going to be at the beach for a very long time, you can do this with a lake, you have my, my permission. Um, stand at the water's edge, look at the level of the water, scoop out some of the water with your hands, and see how much the whole water level drops. <laughs> that's, that's how small you are. If one day that the Lord gives you kids and you, you're at the beach with your kids, show your children how small your hands are compared to God's. And say, look at what a stupid, ridiculous amount of water I can carry in my hands. Look what God can do. Or verse 12, the, the end of 12, who, who has weighed the mountains in scales? When was the last time you used scales? What were you doing? Maybe you were baking and were weighing some, some flour or some sugar. Well, think about that. Think about the amount you would weigh in scales and then think, yep, yeah, with God, he weighs the Andes. He weighs the Himalayas. He weighs the Alps. That's what God does with his scales. And you can imagine God kind of a creation going, mm, bit more rock, bit more rock. Yep, that's, that's perfect for the Himalayas. They're done now. I'm going to move on to the next one. That is what God does. And it's not just God's scale and his strength, it's his wisdom. Have a look at verse um, 13. What, what man shows God his counsel? Which of us does God come to and say, hey, I really need your advice? Okay, there's some stuff going on, on, on in, the, in the planet, there's lots of issues going on. I would love your input. I would love your counsel. Uh, just imagine if, if uh, someone is elected prime minister in my country or, or president here, and just imagine someone is elected and they say, do you know what, I don't need wisdom from anyone else at all. I'm not going to have a cabinet. I'm not going to have any advisors. I'm not going to have any help because I know everything. Imagine if, if Dr. White was to, to make some changes at Cedarville and go, do you know what? I don't need other faculty here. I can teach it all. I don't need a board of trustees. I don't need advice. I don't need counsel. I don't need accountability. I know everything. It is ridiculous when we apply that to any one of us, but it is true when we apply it to God. God does not need a committee to run things past. God is not trying to keep up with someone else's regulations. Uh, the seas, the mountains, the creation, all of that is God's idea. That is not the case with us. We desperately need advice and counsel from others. Even if we've got a kind of IQ that is, is pretty impressive, we still are so limited in what we perceive and in what we know. Uh, there's a group of pastors with us this morning who advise the school. Thank you. Thank you for your service. This school knows it needs advice. It needs counsel. Because all of us do, but God doesn't. Uh, think about the sky, verse 22. It is God who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. It is God who spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Um, when I was a, a kid, my, my parents never took me camping, for which I am very deeply thankful. Um, <laughs> never quite seen the thing about camping. Uh, if you're going on vacation, you want your standard of living to be at least equal and preferably be better than the standard of living you normally have, not worse than it. But on the very rare occasion I have had to go camping, me trying to put a tent together is, it's pathetic. <laughs> I am hopeless. Uh, it takes me about 50 minutes just to try to put new sheets on a bed. <laughs> and yet God can spread the skies above like a tent to dwell in. When we wake up and, and see the sky above us, we're not sort of seeing a, you know, a bit that didn't fit and a, and a gap here and a, and a hole there and a tear. No, God is perfectly able to do that. He is an amazing creator. 
Or verse 26, think about the night sky. Lift your eyes on high and, and see. Look at the stars and think, who, who created these? Uh, Psalm 19 tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens are God's daily blog. And each day his message actually is the same. It is the God who has made this is glorious. He's amazing. He knows the stars one by one. We're still trying to catch up with even how many there are. And God knows every single one of them. Not one of them is missing. If not one star is missing, if God's knowledge of the cosmos is so comprehensive, do you think he's overlooked you? As a Ray Ortland once said, God's greatness doesn't mean he's so big that he overlooks you. God's greatness is so big that he can't overlook you. Verse 26, not one is missing. Um, a group of us from church went out for a, a sort of Sunday lunch after, after church one week. We thought we'd grab all the kind of um, 20s and 30s and, and say, whoever wants to come out for lunch, we're all going to go out for lunch together. And then we're going to go for a hike after lunch. And it was a great idea, trying to help people kind of make connections and feel included. And it was going great until... Towards the end of the hike, one of the guys suddenly went, oh no. I mean, what's wrong? He said, I was going to pick a couple of people up for this. I was meant to be driving them to the, to the restaurant and then bringing them on the hike. I totally forgot. And he felt awful. Somewhere there were two people waiting for him to pick them up, to take them to this lunch that was meant to help people feel included and not overlooked. <laughs> Whoops. We don't have that, we, that happens with us. Parents with, with even just two kids, you, you know, every parent has a story they've they lost a kid at some point. You know, we counted two out and one of them is somewhere in this shopping mall, we just don't know where. But with God, not one is missing. He can keep track of everything. But he's not just sovereign over creation, he's sovereign over the nations. Think about the nations. Uh, when there's a, a G8 or G7 or whatever it is, summit that goes on, think about the, just the enormous amount of planning and security and complexity and logistics that goes into just getting those egos in the same room to talk to each other. Think about the power represented by those leaders, the combined wealth, the combined number of, of warheads. And then look at verse 15 and smile at the ridiculousness of it all. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. Okay, if you're carrying a bucket of water somewhere and you, you spill a little drip, you don't think, oh my goodness, I've got to go back and get that drip. Uh, if you're filling your, your, your car up with gas at the gas station and a, a little bit of gas drips onto the floor, you're not thinking, I need to go and ask for a refund for that little drip that didn't actually make it into the car. No, the, the drop is so insignificant. We don't bother about it. We don't even notice it. And God is saying that is what our nations are like to him. That's how intimidating they are to our God. Uh, they're accounted, verse 15, as the dust on the scale. So when you are maybe at the grocery store and you're measuring some, some weighing some fruit to, to bag up and, and purchase and you see a bit of dust on one of the pieces of fruit, you don't think, oh my goodness, I've got to get rid of that piece of dust because it's, it's going to so affect the weight of what I'm buying. No, it's negligible. So verse 16, Lebanon would not suffice for fuel nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. Lebanon, I'm sure, was a big deal at the time. And to God, it's like, mate, barely even registers. God is not intimidated by the rulers and nations of this planet. He is not intimidated by our, 
our leaders that, that strut about with so much swagger and self-importance, God cannot be intimidated. God is not scrambling to respond to global events thinking, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do now? It doesn't mean God doesn't care about those things. It just means those things, they don't threaten him. They don't intimidate him. Verse 17, that the nations are as nothing before him. Actually, they're accounted by him as less than nothing. All human big dealness doesn't even register as zero, it registers as less than zero. Now, you may well be someone who other people look to. You may be someone who, who has clout, who has power, who's who has a, a kind of natural authority. You may be someone who intimidates others. You may be someone with a domineering personality. You may be someone who just makes other people do things. And yet all of your big dealness registers as a negative to God. When we see ourselves and our creator rightly in proportion to one another, our big dealness evaporates. If you are strutting about with self-importance, you've forgotten who your creator is. I think it was Jen Wilkin who once said that no one stands next to the Grand Canyon and says, hey, I'm awesome. No, the scale and beauty of creation reorients and reproportions our sense of ourself. Verse 23, think about some of these, these big global leaders. God is the one who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Each of the kind of the big deal leaders of our time, they're gonna be here for a bit and then they're gonna go. Verse 24, it's over so quickly. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely have they got their feet under the desk and that the Twitter handle of their office adjusted, then they're gone. God just has to blow on them and they wither. He just has to exhale in their direction and they're done. Their time is up. God alone is sovereign. So what on earth are you going to trust in instead of God? Verse 18, to whom then will you liken God or, or what likeness compare with him? What even comes close? Well, in our ridiculousness, verse 19, idols. In Isaiah's day, this was a physical idol, a craftsman casts it. A goldsmith overlays it with gold and, and casts for its silver chain. Someone has to do a lot of work for this idol even to exist. And get this, if you're a, a poor Israelite and you, you can't afford all the kind of gold bling on your idol, he who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that won't rot. That's as good as he can get. I need an idol that won't rot. How pathetic is that? He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that won't move. He's like, I need real help here so that my idol won't fall over. That is how ridiculous our idols are. They're inactive. The best they can do is not fall over. And yet compare that idol to God, even in this one this one passage, think about the verbs that are applied to God. He speaks, he comes, he cares, he gathers, he measures, he holds, he sees, and he gives. So to whom then will you liken God? 
What's your idol? We, we can laugh at the Israelite craftsman having to physically put the gold on his idol, physically having to prop it up so it will actually stay up. Here's a question for you. What stops you praying? What stops you depending on God? Put it in another way, what needs to be taken away from your life for you to start praying? Uh, what do you need to have in place to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say to yourself, I'm going to be okay. Life's going to be okay. Compare that to God. God alone is sovereign. God alone is the one with actual power. And then finally, as we come to verses 27 to 31, God alone is our strength. This is why God's sovereignty is so precious to us. God uses his sovereignty, his power, to strengthen us. God uses his resources for our sake, for our good. So again, verse 28, have you not known, guys, do you not know this stuff? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Because God is sovereign, you can't exhaust him. You can be the most high maintenance sinner in all of creation. You will not wear God out. You will not deplete him. You're not going to weary God with your neediness. He can take it. God does not need us, but invites us to come to him with all of our needs, and you are not going to overwhelm him. Verse 29, he gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. There are days when we slightly kid ourselves and think, do you know what? I think I've got stuff covered today. I'm, I am on top of life. I've got things sorted out. There are days like that, perhaps rare days for some of us, but there are days like that. But there are other days when we know, we know our weakness. There are days when we wake up and we feel defeated even before the day's begun. And we feel faint. We realize that we have no might. And we're coming to God not with just a little bit of strength. We're coming to God with no strength and saying, I've got nothing. And God's response to that is, that's great, I can work with that. Because God gives power to the faint. God does not say to us, come on, find your inner strength. It's down there somewhere, you just gotta find it. God does not say, come on, you, are you still weak? Have you really not figured life out yet? How many days are we gonna have this dynamic of you needing me each day? No, God gives strength to him who has no might. God loves to do that. Verse 30, even youths shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. Okay, you guys are in your prime. 
This may well be as healthy and as strong as you will ever be in your life. I'm talking to the students here, not you faculty, okay? You've, you've <laughs> long since passed that. And it, you can be as strong and as fit and as able as you will ever be, and you will still, still, you will find your limits. You will run out of strength, you will collapse, you will stumble, you will fall. We are weak. God has given us a pretty powerful reminder of this. We have to be asleep for a third of our lives. That's how impressive we are. <laughs> uh, one of the Puritans uh, composed this prayer about sleep. It's amazing. He said, may my frequent lying down make me familiar with death. The bed I approach reminds me of the grave. The eyes I now close picture to me their final closing. Sleep is a very powerful reminder of our mortality. We're, we're kind of playing dead every single night. That's how weak we are. And yet... Verse 31, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. God is able to do the impossible and keep us going. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. There will be times when spiritually you are able to soar. God will just lift your feet off the ground. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I, I can't help but notice the, the deceleration that you see in this verse. Soaring, running, walking. That is your life. And yet the Lord is with you at each step. And in Christ, you will always be moving forward with God. It may at some times be at an amazing pace, you're just steaming ahead as a Christian. At other times, it may be one stumbling step after another. Either way, if we look to him, he will give us strength. If our hope is in him, if our dependence is on him, if we wait on him. So my brothers and sisters, you have no need to worry that God can't see you. If there is not one star that is missing, then, then you have not dropped off God's radar. He is your sovereign. He alone is your sovereign. There's no chance that he can't see you. And because of that, he alone is our strength. That Sovereign, great God of all power loves to serve us and to be to us what we can never be left to ourselves. So look to him and keep going. Let me pray for us. Father, help us to look to you today with all that uh, is before us, with all the things that may weigh down on us, Help us to remember, even as we walk around this campus, that every tree, every blade of grass, the sky above us, everything has been made by you. You are sovereign. You see us. You know our situation actually better than we do. And you serve us and strengthen us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day.